Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, let's get uh, started. Uh, very warm welcome um, today um, at the Internet Governance uh, Forum. Um, this forum is about uh, uh, data governance and competition. So thank you very much for attending, for having gotten up so early. I was informed that normally you, you arrive here at 12 o'clock in order to, to be really fresh and ready for the night. Uh, but I hope we get you started with this uh, really uh, interesting debate uh, on competition and um, data. My name is Philip Steinberg. I'm Director General for Economic Policy in the Federal Ministry for Economics and Energy. And you might have guessed it. I'm responsible for competition policy in Germany and we are just about to release a recast of our competition law where we will include um, some of the suggestions um, we're going to hear about um, uh, later um, on. Um, this topic I think is it's, it's really um, uh, very interesting and uh, really um, one of the topics uh, which will gain e even more importance, I think. It's about competition, it's about the digital economy, it's about the platform economy. One, some of the buzzwords um, you, you're all familiar with, of course, are um, network effects, superstar firms, winner-takes-all markets, um, and of course uh, the tendency for competition, uh, for monopolization, and concentration. Um, of course, these fundamental changes um, raise many concerns concerning the adequacy of the um, current competition policy framework. And so basically the debate here is, um, of course, is it necessary to update our competition law regulatory framework? And I, I think it's not, uh, not uh, too dare to say that of course the competition uh, law framework is vital for the functioning of our economies and uh, uh, that is really one of the, the backbones um, of, uh, of, of most uh, states' uh, regulatory um, uh, framework. So I'm, um, I'm really very happy to introduce a very distinguished one uh, colleague said a panel, not a panel. And I have to apologize, of course, uh, first because uh, you might have realized that it's quite male, our, uh, our uh, manual here. So um, I have to excuse Heike Schweitzer. Heike Schweitzer, who is, of course, you might have guessed it, he, she is female, but um, more importantly, she's a renowned expert on competition law in Germany. She is a member of the expert panel of the European Comp uh, Commission. And uh, we have invited her, but unfortunately, she is ill. So I have to, um, I have to ex uh, excuse her. But um, uh, still, we have, uh, I think, a lot to talk about. Um, um, on my right-hand side, um, uh, we have uh, Martin Schallbruch. He is the deputy director of the Digital Society Institute at the Euro European School of Management and T Technology in Berlin. He's also, and that's the main reason he's here, um, because he's a co-chair of the German Federal Commission Competition Law 4.0 which has just released his um, uh, report. Um, then um, uh, we have uh, also to my right hand side, we have Philip uh, Marston. He's a deputy chair of the Enforcement Decision Making Committee of the Bank of England. He's a professor of, at College of Europe and he's a member of the UK Digital Competition Expert Panel. One of the main reasons he's here and of course he holds many other functions, but for, uh, because we don't have so much time, I skip them. And then I turn to my left hand side, we have uh, Ioannis Lianos, he's uh, Chair of Global Competition, Law and Public Policy at University College London, and he's also a co-author of the BRICS report, Digital Era Competition, and once again that's one of the main reasons um, um, we are um, here. So. This uh, panel, of course, uh, is, it's, quite, it's quite a challenge for all of us because, because we have one hour and uh, seven mi minutes have already elapsed, one hour actually, to present the main, the key points of those reports um, the panel members uh, uh, have uh, released. So it's really about the key messages, uh, um, if possible, really um, uh, make it, make it uh, concise and make, make it uh, uh, clear, because all of you, you have five minutes to present the main messages 
of your uh, reports and you have, might have realized I'm German, so we like, we like rules and we like to enforce them. So I will, I will be very strict and I will, um, I will um, uh, enforce them. So the idea is that you basically you give us an idea of, of the main, main points because um, I've n named one of some of the buzzwords um, already. Um, but of course, it's interesting to see where do we find common ground how to regulate the, comp uh, the, uh, the digital economy, and where are differences between them, um, maybe, uh, maybe as well. We'll, of course, have some time to, um, to engage in a discussion here on the panel, but of course, I'll open, uh, open the panel up, and then uh, we can um, uh, bring you in. And of course, there are online participants as well, so I invite you all, of course, online as well, to, to come in with your questions. Um, so. I think uh, uh, we start uh, with you, Johannes, if that's, uh, uh, that's okay, um, if you could share the main insights of your report with us. Um, the panel is yours. Uh, uh, sure. Thank you very much for your invitation. Let me just say that I'm also the um, head of the Hellenic Competition Commission, but I'm not representing, of course, here the views of, of the Commission. Uh, I would say that there are three main points uh, that come out of the uh, BRICS report which is a work uh, of, a, um, of around 35 uh, researchers from uh, five BRICS countries. Uh, the first is that uh, we believe that the simple economics of neoclassical price theory uh, are not fit uh, for purpose uh, in the digital economy. We are coming up uh, from the um, perspective of complex uh, economics. And why actually uh, the simple economics do not work? Because First, I think that the simple economics that we apply implement a competition or focus on market definition. Uh, however, as uh, many of you are familiar with the multi-sided markets uh, theory uh, and, of course, the presence of ecosystems in the context of uh, the digital economy, uh, well, this is very reductive in the way of uh, understanding and assessing uh, competition. The second issue uh, which we have problem with is the fact that, well, price, you no know, classical price theory focuses on price. However, many of the competitive strategies that we uh, observe in digital markets uh, are actually non-price related, and therefore we need other tools in order to deal with those. Uh, and thirdly, I think that the uh, current mainstream paradigm of competition law focuses on consumer welfare, and this is usually narrowly uh, defined as consumer uh, surplus. Uh, but we think that this is definitely very important, but I think this is only one of the dimensions uh, of which competition law should focus on. Uh, we believe that uh, issues like privacy, uh, uh, economic democracy, complex equality are important considerations in the context of the digital economy and obviously have motivated a lot of uh, thinking lately with regards to populist antitrust. So the first uh, uh, message is that uh, simple economics do not work. We have to deal with uh, complex uh, economics and there's a lot of uh, work uh, uh, on, um, in particular coming out of the Institute of Santa Fe. Uh, basically uh, looking to different concepts like tipping points, leverage points, increasing returns to scale and scope of path dependence and different tools like agent-based modeling in order to implement competition along the digital era. Now the second, uh, I think, uh, message that um, we are uh, putting forward in the report is that competition authorities have been focusing a lot on inter-ecosystem competition by we believe that in some contexts, inter-ecosystem competition might not necessarily work because of the presence of strong network effects and the absence of multi-homing, and therefore intra-ecosystem competition plays and should play a significant role, and competition authorities should deal with intra-ecosystem competition. And this brings me to the third main message uh, of the report, which is that we are focusing on value capture as well as value generation. I think most of the reports have been focusing on value generation. I think this is very important and valid. Increasing the size of the pie is important. But it's also important to see how the pie is allocated. And this is basically the value capture. And things, this brings forward different concepts of competition, what we call vertical competition, the competition between various companies which are present in the different segments of the value chain for the largest percentage of the surplus value generated by the value chain. And I think this is a, a dimension of competition uh, that does not only focus on product markets, but also on financial markets. 
Uh, and I think this is also a significant aspect of our report, this focus on financialization, this idea that many of these companies get their value out of their appreciation in uh, financial markets, and that a lot of their strategies are basically focusing on the perceptions they will provide to the financial markets. And therefore, competition law assessment, uh, if it has to be fit for the digital economy, has also to take into consideration uh, financial markets and financialization. And I will end up here on my five minutes. Thank you very much. This is impressive. You would have had 40 seconds left, so, uh, but uh, this is impressive. So I just, uh, this was, uh, I think, very, very interesting, of course, uh, giving us uh, an outline of, of how the economics are changing. Of course, I'm going to ask you later on, so you can already think about it. So what are the concrete implications for the, the regulatory competition um, framework? Um, but now I will turn to my very right-hand side, to Martin uh, Schallbruch, and ask him uh, what are the main conclusions of your, your work in the uh, German Commission uh, um, uh, competition law uh, 4.0. Uh, uh, do you share the analysis? Uh, what are your concrete uh, conclusions? And maybe you can say a word on data and access to data as well, if that has played a role in your work. Thank you, Philip. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, competition law is uh, one of the key priorities of the upcoming European Commission, and one of the tasks of our Commission Competition Law 4.0 was to contribute to the German and European debate about uh, competition law and digital economy. So our idea was to give specific recommendations for German and European lawmakers regarding the development of competition law. Philip asked for key messages of our um, commission, and one key message is that we do not see a need to change basic principles of European competition law to meet the new challenges of the digital economy. But we see a need to add some additional instruments to address the role of data, the role of the market-dominant platforms, and the effectiveness of antitrust enforcement. Let me give you some of our specific recommendations regarding these three key issues of our report. The role of data. In the digital economy, better access to data is a competitive advantage. And this is um, um, very true, especially for user data. User data access um, allows for analysis of user behavior, improvement of services, and creates strong lock-in effects and reduces customer choices and competition. So one of our key approaches in our report is to strengthen consumer power regarding their own data. With two ideas um, more, um, in more detail presented in our report, as published in English as well, uh, one idea is um, to transfer the concept of opening user accounts for third-party providers from the financial sector in Europe to other sectors. We have, since uh, Payment Service Directive 2, an instrument in the financial sector that uh, banks have to grant access to user accounts for third-party providers if and only if the customer requests to do so. So opening up accounts, having the chance of easier multi-homing, having um, reducing lock-in effects. And we think in the Commission that we could transfer this concept to other long-term contractual relationships in the digital um, service market. Second idea to strengthen consumer um, pro uh, power and, on the other hand, granting more access to data is the establishment of so-called data trustees. Data trustees um, are companies which address uh, a need of uh, companies who want to access data of a large number of data subjects. Individual data is protected by the GDPR, and uh, to get this data, for example, to innovate business models, you need the consent of each individual data subject. And data trustees would be of help because they could um, act as an intermediary to give companies uh, um, data on behalf of the customers and in line with the data protection preferences and purposes the customer defines in advance. So these two ideas are our major recommendations regarding data governance. 
um, let me add um, two more recommendations regarding digital platforms and uh, antitrust enforcement. The, the power of platforms uh, from the view of our commission is not only coming from network effects and uh, economies of scale, but also by a, um, a very strong conglomerate effect. This conglomerate effect leads to positions that are difficult to contest and that are um, having a cross-market relevance. Um, therefore, our advice and our recommendation is that we should establish rules for dominant online platforms. We recommended an EU regulation for dominant online platforms that target this specific situation of um, big conglomerate digital platforms. These rules um, could be rules um, prohibiting self-referencing of own services, strengthening data portability, um, strengthening interoperability, uh, especially interoperability of complementary services to these platforms. And the third issue I would like to mention is the antitrust enforcement. Um, we have seen that impact-based prohibitions and remedies typically take much too long. I think the Google Shopping case uh, took uh, six years in, uh, within the Commission, and now we're at the court, and we haven't a court decision yet. So we have to speed up the antitrust enforcement. And the same situation is in other regulatory um, subjects concerning digital platforms true as well, security, privacy, and so on. And uh, our idea and our recommendation is to create a European Digital Markets Transformation Agency as um, support to antitrust and other regulators to um, follow market developments, dependencies, ecosystems, assess such things as data, power, data transfer standards, and interoperability. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much indeed, uh, Martin, for this very uh, concise uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we, I'm sure we're going to uh, talk about. Uh, but let me turn uh, uh, to, to Philip uh, now, and uh, um, I would like to ask you to share some of your insight from the UK digital competition expert. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Well, why are we all here today? Uh, well, one narrative is that the sky is falling. Competition authorities have allowed too many mergers, digital markets are tipping, even with consumer benefits in terms of low prices or no price. There are many harms to suppliers, indirect harms to consumers, reduced choice, loss of privacy. Um, these tech giants are all run by creeps. Um, this has fostered what I will call, with my British accent, a leave campaign, as in leave the currently relatively permissive competition law approach, leave the consumer welfare standard, take back control, make antitrust great again, MAGA. This is populist-led, it has a disdain for experts. In this view, ec experts and economic analysis have allowed too much power in the hands of too few. So these, this narrative asks for more intervention, substantive changes to antitrust, reversing the burden of proof in mergers for digital firms, focusing on structural harms and economic dependency. And there is some authority at the European level for focusing on competitive structure, not just competition, wealth, uh, consumer welfare. And there's some authority historically in the US, not so much MAGA as MAFA, make antitrust fair again. Now, there's another narrative, unsurprisingly, which is the Remain narrative. And this narrative is expert-led, and it notes the benefits of digital developments and innovation for consumers and small business. And this has two voices with one message. And the message is, stay calm, do nothing. Right? There's no need to change anything. And the first voice is from the large tech firms. They say, nothing to look at here. Competition is a click away. Move along. And by the way, be grateful for all the innovation you have on your little glass rectangle that you're all playing with right now. All right? Maybe tweak a few things. Maybe look at potential harm, dynamic competition. Maybe give the competition authorities a bit more money. And at the same time, the competition authorities, some competition authorities are also saying, don't do too much here, don't take back control, don't break up companies, just give us a few more resources, otherwise you might harm innovation. So remain expert-led, remain evidence-led, remain part 
of the consumer welfare beliefs. So we were asked by Her Majesty the Queen <laughs> to try to find common ground between leave and remain. And in our Furman report, this is what we tried to do, to try, try to take the beliefs from both sides and bring them together. And so what we basically noticed in our evidence and our hearings was that the sky isn't falling. There's huge benefits from digital and from innovation. But equally, a lot of the theories of harm are very familiar to us. And traditional competition law analysis of leveraging and exclusion can handle many of these problems, but not all of them. And so what we felt is that it's not true that we should move along. Competition is clearly not a click away. Data is not sunshine, not in the world of walled gardens. And competition is usually for the market. But what we need to do is introduce, in our view, some changes to competition law relating to focusing on a balance of harms approach for merger control, uh, relating to speeding up interim measures, relating to looking more at competition and potential competition. But in particular, we should introduce a pro-competitive ex-ante regulatory structure in which we find that a way of in a room about this size with about this many people, with tech giants, venture capital firms, complainants, consumer groups, to identify a code of conduct for behavior that we don't want to see the digital players doing. And then we enforce this through a digital markets unit. So this is ex ante competition regulation that would focus on firms with strategic market status. And to be clear, this is, very, this is lower than a dominance threshold. This is a faster moving intervention than a 12 year abuse of dominance case. But this is to get ahead of the problems. And when we've talked to many of these tech giants, they indeed have said, well, actually, many of the things you're asking for in terms of preventing self-preferencing, preventing exclusivities, uh, uh, making sure that firms can't um, uh, pro prohibit you from multi-homing, these are a lot of the things that the tech giants say they're already doing already. So if that's true, and I don't believe it is, but if that's true, then these firms could sign up to these kinds of principles. So that's what we're proposing, to complement and I trust to also have pro-competitive ex-ante regulation enforced by a unit that is engaging with the tech giants, learning by doing, and has a very, very quick enforcement mechanism of a few weeks, not many, many years. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, Philip, that's just brilliant. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, using uh, the, uh, the examples you used, and of course, um, it's always a pleasure to listen to this uh, beautiful uh, Oxford English uh, accent. So, um, I think let's let's start with. I mean, I think there was one interesting element of of, of uh, uh, the interventions of, of of all of you, but especially of, of Philip and Martin, um, arguing, if I understood it correctly, to go beyond antitrust trust law. I mean, you you called Philip. You said, of course, we need to make antitrust law big again, and uh, and uh, uh, we we have to enforce it correctly. Um, of course, there was was some agreement on making on on speeding it up on on, on interim measures. But then both of you said you said. We we need this pro-competitive ex-ante regulation mechanism. And Martin, uh, if I understood him correctly, uh, argued for, he said basically, well, we need regulatory law as well, actually regulating big platforms um, concerning self-preferencing, uh, interoperability, and, and so on. Um, so maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Is, so is that, so is, isn't that a little bit contradictory? On the one hand, you said we need to make competition law, competition policy more effective. But on the other hand, you, you say, well, it's not effective enough, so we need to go beyond competition um, law. Uh, so maybe, um, Philip, you, you want to start again? Shall I start first? Okay. So first hashtag of the talk, hashtag interoperability stimulates competition. Right? Interoperability stimulates competition. Competition law isn't really about interoperability. Competition law is about ex post analysis, takes many years, many experts trying to work out if harm has happened. What we need to do, I feel, is to get ahead of some problems. So many of our recommendations to improve antitrust law were to help us catch up with the digital giants, but our pro-competitive regulatory suggestions are not just a catch-up, they're to get ahead of problems. And one of the things is to build into the systems interoperability and data portability so that the technical structure of, of open markets and the original plans for the internet, where you have closed systems on top of open systems, is more disintermediated 
if you will. And many of the technical experts in this room will know a lot more than I do about this. But the idea is to introduce a layer in which competition can happen, new products can develop. And we did this in our, in our, in our UK retail banking study, where we looked at an oligopoly, essentially, of large banks. And we tried to not break them up, though there was a strong political recommendation that we break them up, but instead open them up through open data, open APIs, interoperability, and data portability. And that has indeed fostered new consumer choice tools digitally and made the incumbent banks feel the heat of competition. Thank you very much, Martin. Well, I think we totally agree with the idea of having a pro-competitive ex-ante regulatory environment. So I fully agree with that. Um, but this environment has not necessarily been um, um, introduced or implemented within competition law at all. Um, the, competi the, the question of competition on platforms and competition off platforms is dealt with in different regulations, such as privacy regulation, the right of data portability, such as a liability of platforms, a regulation around liability. Uh, is affecting competition, security regulation, media regulation, and so on. So we have a lot of competitive, competitive effect or competition effects uh, in uh, different kinds of regulation. And if we look at our idea of having a better regulatory environment with X and rules, we have to have a more holistic view. And I found this holistic view in the BRICS report um, also, a more holistic view on the role of digital platforms and on the different regulatory environments we have um, um, in competition law and in sectoral law. And one idea of our um, ex ante system for uh, dominant digital platforms is to have some of the major means for more competitions within the competition law. And uh, from my perspective, and I'm a computer scientist, um, uh, interoperability and data portability are uh, very core um, ideas of fostering uh, competition. And that should be not only be ruled out by um, sectoral regulation, but also be a part of the general competition regulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Martin. I think quite a lot of agreement here on, on the right-hand uh, side. So, Johannes, you have actually um, actually given us the big picture about how, uh, how the economics change. You said simple economics uh, don't work. So, what do you make out of those concrete propositions, or what are your concrete propositions to deal with those developments? Sure. Um, so in our report, we obviously uh, take the approach that has been suggested before in terms of the more mainstream approach to uh, promote interoperability, to adopt interim measures, uh, to uh, lower probably uh, the extent uh, of judicial and the intensity of judicial review in these uh, very uh, rapidly developing markets. Uh, but I would like just to um, uh, basically make uh, uh, three points. Uh, the first one is that the main problem we have is that there has been a period of value extraction without proper rules, without proper institutions. This is what led basically to the situation we have now. And I do agree that competition law on its own cannot provide an answer to the problem. So what we have been putting forward in our report is what I call a toolkit approach. And obviously, uh, the toolkit approach will depend from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It will depend on the um, development of the digital uh, economy, but also on the institutional capabilities that its jurisdiction has. But more generally speaking, I think that the first question one should ask is, do we have in the specific market or specific context, do we have a winner takes most or a winner takes all game? Now, if it's a winner takes most game, that means that competition might still work in this particular context. But if it is a winner takes all game, then we need probably to think about the presence of a natural monopoly and possibly more uh, kind of utility style regulation. And we make some suggestions about that. We, for instance, indicate that that could probably take the form of limiting uh, the amount of advertising on platforms, or it could be on uh, somehow imposing um, payments uh, to be made to users for the use of their data. 
The second, I think, important issue, uh, and which actually comes out to the issue of data, is that one of the main problems we have, I think, in the current context, is that we have a missing market. We have a data missing market. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, when, basically, the uh, Google is selling, and I can take this example, is selling uh, predictions to advertisers, and obviously there is a market there. But on the other side, uh, there is an exchange between the users and Google. But there, actually, we don't really have a market because users do not have property rights. So therefore, we don't really have an understanding about the valuation by the users of how much this data uh, is, uh, is valued. And I think this is really an important uh, element in the missing uh, element in the picture that we have. So probably we need to think about ways to increase commodification of data or even of attention uh, in that context and obviously provide users possibility to uh, transfer data uh, or transfer more generally uh, their, uh, uh, their, uh, their attention. Uh, the other element I think which is quite important is to uh, understand that uh, in the current context we have important digital platforms that exercise monopsony power in labor markets. Uh, we have obviously a number of freelancers, artists, journalists that are basically working for these platforms and apparently do not necessarily get a fair share of the surplus value. Uh, and obviously that is because of the monopsony power of the digital platform. So therefore we need probably to think about the existence and the creation of countervailing powers through, for instance, collective bargaining of these freelancers or of, also of users. Uh, and finally, I think that we need to develop competition law that takes into account not just price, but also other dimensions of well-being, and in particular, uh, privacy uh, or uh, complex equality. And I think this can be done by uh, adding uh, certain concepts to the existing uh, toolkit. For instance, when we think about the exploitation abuses, uh, well, I mean, uh, we can probably add different forms of exploitation. Uh, manipulation, it could be uh, attention theft, some actually have uh, put forward as an idea. So that could be uh, different forms of exploitation that we can enforce through uh, competition law. Uh, and secondly, and final uh, element is that we probably need to think differently about power. We have been focusing too much probably on market power, which is a very, much fo very much based on the idea that uh, we need to have uh, uh, you know, competition between substitutes. But as I mentioned before, an important dimension of competition in these value chains, digital value chains, is vertical competition. So we need to develop a theory of vertical power. And I think uh, the various reports have been putting forward some possible uh, uh, dimensions of this uh, vertical power theory. For instance, uh, in uh, the Furman report, uh, the uh, Furman report actually put forward this idea of strategic uh, uh, market uh, position. Uh, or the German reports uh, that uh, Heike Schweitzer um, and her colleagues uh, completed has actually put forward uh, this uh, idea of intermediation power. So I think all that somehow shows that power is more related to the position of a specific platform in a network, so it's positional power, it's based on status, and this is something that the current metric of market power does not take into account. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um I would like to, to, to stick a little bit, with, uh, and that's the last question here for the panel, then I will open it up. So think of your questions, uh, please, online and offline. So of course, data. I mean, I think data is one of the most debated buzzwords, and when I witness some of the discussions, actually, sometimes I think without no offense to anybody, but still there's a lot of uncertainty and insecurity, and uh, there's a lot of we have to do, we should do, and of course there are many different approaches. We have the GDPR with its regulations, we have competition law, we have the calls for regulation, for um, what, uh, what Martin uh, Scheibel called uh, data uh, trustees, so there's a, almost a little bit of confusion, you know. Everybody agrees that data is important, the new oil, the new resource for the digital age, but so what if you could try to be, be brief, what is, what is the role of competition, policy, competition law, and, uh, and uh, what is the role or what other um, regulatory instruments or other instruments in general uh, do, we, uh, do we need? Maybe Martin, you, you start off, please. Well, you, you probably know that in Germany we have a strong political discussion about um, opening 
um, data of big companies for other companies, for competitors. One of the uh, ruling parties, the SPD, um, uh, made the uh, recommendation of having a data for all law, so um, giving uh, companies access to, da access to data of their competitors. And we, we have a, had a strong debate about that in our commission, and we found that opening the data of companies is always um, a, a problem of reducing innovation of this company. Data is somehow the source for innovation, and if you too early open uh, data access, you have a block for innovation within the company. So we did not come to a solution that this one-size-fits-all um, uh, approach uh, may work. Uh, our idea is to have uh, some kind of, a, I like the word, of a toolkit approach, so to, to define some more specific instruments for data access. Of course, we have the instrument under the existing competition law that data access denials can be treated at an, as an abuse of um, um, dominance. Um, this could be made a little bit more effective, and I think Germany is doing well with that, with the new draft of the German uh, Competition Act. Um, Germany is uh, trying to, to build this in a more effective way. And there are some more tools. I, I mentioned uh, tools such as uh, data trustees or opening uh, user accounts, uh, obligations for platforms as um, market dominant platforms um, could have an, an enhanced um, a role in data sharing. Uh, we have some experiences with sectoral regulation in opening data, such as a energy sector where data is open about energy production and energy transport, and that fosters also new business models. And one um, important um, aspect we identified in our commission is the role, the raising role of um, public data, open data of um, public authorities, of government, of um, public uh, rules sectors such as healthcare or energy or mobility can help to foster competition. We made some hearings with small and medium enterprises who said we would like to have um, easier access to uh, open data from governments, more standardized platforms, um, a, a broader um, open uh, portal or something else to access public data, because public data such as mobility data is always um, a help for developing business models. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, explanation. So, Philip, the obligation to share data and what data, would that be um, comprised by your pro-competitive ex ante regulatory mechanism or do, would we need a specific regulation or specific mechanisms, instruments to, to, to uh, impose this obligation to share data? Thank you. Well, what, what I, thank you. What I perceive is a digital markets unit that is engaging with the tech giants and the key complainants and the consumer groups to identify, indeed, what data is the most important data to share. And remember, of course, a lot of the tech firms will be a bit inconsistent with their argument, arguments with, in resisting this. Some of them will say, it's not about the data. Data is everywhere. It's about the engineers. So, you know, then I always ask them, so what's the problem with releasing some of the data if it's not about the data? And they say, oh, you will change our fundamental business model and uh, you're chilling innovation incentives, blah, blah, blah. And then other times they'll say, well, the data is actually really crucial to us and, you, you know, uh, this is where we make our money from it, you know. So I, it would be nicer to have a conversation, a real debate about this. But I, another hashtag, hashtag follow the data, hashtag follow the money, all right? It, the data is related to our attention which is related to our engagement. Those are the kinds of markets I'm interested in looking at, engagement and attention markets, which is where they're competing for and where they're making their advertising uh, euros. And so when we said open up the banking data, which is some of the most fi uh, commercially and financially and, and sensitive information that we all have, our own you know, financial status, et cetera, like that, we were not saying release the data into an iPad or into a USB stick. We were saying, can some of these companies that are are entering the market or seeking to enter the market, access some of the data of the incumbents to train their algorithms and to be able to operate new products with consumer consent. Right? We were not saying release the data so that the sky will fall in. And all I'm saying is if we don't try to introduce some of these models 
something much worse will come down the pipe. What we're actually introducing is not something that is actually going to make the sky fall in and destroy the business models. It'll just help them evolve and adjust. You know, if we don't uh, uh, find a way of addressing these kinds of imbalances in power and find new ways of introducing competition, I fear a much colder regulatory winter will come through. Hashtag winter is coming, right? And so we need to do something to make sure that it's not a scary regulatory winter. It's something that actually engages companies to become more competitive themselves. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, beautiful uh, pictures. Um, so, uh, Janis, you talked about a lack of a market for data, and uh, you asked for commodification of data. So does this imply you, you remain within the framework of competition law, competition policy, or would you say we need to go, go beyond as well? Well, as I mentioned before, I'm in favor of a toolkit approach. Uh, competition forms part of that. But l let me say why data is important. Data is important because of the importance of learning effects. I think we haven't really, we have focused a lot on network effects, but I think the most important issue in digital markets is learning effects. Uh, and why is that? I mean, learning obviously effects take place generally and they're quite positive. Uh, if you are in a particular industry and you know better about this industry, obviously you have an advantage, you have a competitive advantage. It's more difficult for someone to take you out. But I think the digital economy, uh, the learning comes out of data and the development of algorithms that actually make your learning even more powerful which uh, probably leads to a difficulty from, uh, uh, for other companies to enter this market once you have developed really a quite, um, uh, quite important um, learning. So, so, so data is important from that perspective. Now, data, as you mentioned before, is everywhere. So it's a non-driver resource. Uh, and to a certain extent, there are only certain categories of data where we have some scarcity, in particular when you have important regulation, for instance, for medical uh, data, right? There, obviously, is a scarce resource, but generally speaking, for lifestyle data is available, uh, and uh, usually uh, peop uh, people can actually have access to that through different sources. However, as Philip mentioned, the important issue uh, here is uh, the scarcity of attention. Uh, and I think, you know, we need to move a little bit the debate towards attention markets or personalized markets, which is actually quite important in the context of a personalization we will see happening uh, also uh, with regards to the Internet of Things. Now, of course, you know, where is the competition law problem, you will ask me. And I will say there is a competition law problem in the, in the setting of these specific markets. Uh, let me basically give you an example. Uh, well, when you, have, you are using uh, a search engine, let's take the example of Google, or a social media, let's take the example of Facebook. You're actually using this and you have to accept that you'll provide your, your data. Uh, so to a certain extent, there is an agreement that basically uh, enables you to have access to the service by providing your data. And obviously that provides huge advantages uh, to the users. But one will ask, would it be possible to have such a configuration if the market of social media or the market of search engine was competitive? Would it be possible, for instance, to think that uh, in case we had different competitors in these markets, maybe some users could have actually been paid in order to provide their data. Maybe some users would have preferred to pay but not to provide their data or their privacy. Uh, and finally, uh, maybe some users would have probably you know, use their data in order to, uh, uh, to do the service, to, uh, to actually enjoy the service. So what I'm actually saying is that we cannot really see now the preferences of the users expressed in the market, you know, having these three options, and we can think of different others, because of the setting of the market and because of the fact that we have a super dominant firm that basically imposes its choice. What actually I think becomes a competitional problem there is to enable the, uh, you know, to the consumers to choose according to their preferences and to provide basically the virus choices in the marketplace. And that, I think, is definitely the task that competition law should follow. Thank you very much. That was uh, very clear and uh, inspiring. I mean, of course, there are some saying, well, the users could choose already today, but they don't want to. Um, but maybe uh, this, uh, this is a topic for debate or for questions uh, from the audience, online or offline. Are there any remarks, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, I see a question over there. So I don't know. Maybe you have to come. Uh, there's, a mic. there's a mic coming to you. Um, okay. 
Thank you for this very interesting discussion. I'm Zai from IT for Change. Um, I want to talk about the uh, issue of innovation, and you said uh, people say that exclusive data power is necessary for innovation. But what about the counterfactual? What about all the innovation that is not taking place today because of the exclusive data power, right? What about the scores of startups that are bought up before they can even compete by these companies? No one's regulating that. And secondly, um, when we talk about uh, data as a non-rivalrous resource, I would think that at an ecosystem level, and there's some academic work on this, it is actually a rivalrous resource because uh, given the platform model, it would be. Given the fact that networks, uh, network effects reinforce your data power and the other way around, data ends up becoming a rivalrous resource at the ecosystem level. So. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, yeah, Johannes needs to leave at, uh, in five minutes, uh, so um, we we'll, we'll let him go. And I already say thank you now, but you might have a chance to answer them. I would take another question or remark if there is uh, is one. Yeah, the gentleman over here. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this nice. You might introduce yourself briefly as well, so if you sorry. Want. You might introduce yourself briefly as well, if you want to. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a member of parliament in Lebanon, and uh, uh, I'm the head of the IT committee in the parliament. Um, I was just uh, thinking, you, you took into consideration the management of the data and the data governance and how regulation should be managing the data. However, I would like to to go into another view and have a view on, on the regulation by itself, uh, knowing that the regulation is part of a very big burden on companies. And this is like uh, sometimes uh, regulation by itself and GDPR specifically uh, is a big burden for companies and is um, creating disbalancing in uh, in, uh, in competition, like for example, if, if we ap uh, apply GDPR on Facebook, Google, or Amazon, on the big companies, they have the possibility of uh, paying the fines and, uh, and th they are like, uh, they are okay with the regulation. But if we go into small and medium, uh, medium companies, uh, they are much more vulnerable on, uh, on fines and penalties of the GDPR. So there is a, a, a lack of competition. Uh, the the uh, security by design that is imposed by GDPR is much more um, heavy for these small companies than for the large one. And at the same time, uh, by putting such regulation, we are um, killing a little bit the free service of the internet. So I just want to know what is your opinion about this and um, uh, how can regulation also help for a better competition? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I would take a third and last one uh, intervention or question if there is one. The gentleman over there, yeah. Thank you, thank you Chair. My name is Bara Kotieno. I'm representing the Kenya IGF. Uh, interesting conversation, something that we are also facing back at home, although I was looking at it from a different perspective. Um, the, the, uh, for us, it's more a case of um, uh, big telcos uh, with uh, large pools of data that they are able to play around with uh, from an innovative standpoint. And um, the industry is crying foul that uh, should they be broken up because of the monopolistic tendencies, because they are playing around with innovative solutions, and some of them are really coming out to be big money makers. So I don't know from a developing country perspective whether uh, regulatory sandboxes would be something to pursue. I know in the EU your market is much more developed, and so uh, I'm looking at it um, uh, you have regulations in place, but what of countries that do not have regulations? Should we go for regulatory sandboxes? 
Okay, thank you very much. I think fascinating uh, questions. So I would uh, turn to you, and if you just pick the questions you, you want to, uh, innovation not taking place on data, on the burden of regulation, or on the big telcos. All right, there are many, many interesting questions. I unfortunately have the time, limited time. So I would just, uh, basically, I agree with uh, what you mentioned before. I was discussing network effects in the context of uh, outside, you know, inter-ecosystem competition. But once you are intra-ecosystem, of course, you may have uh, network effects. Uh, uh, with regards to, to data. Uh, the second issue with regards to uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, I think that is, this is a huge debate right now. Uh, there have been hundreds of, of mergers and acquisitions in this area. Uh, some actually relying on empirical work done in the pharma sector uh, have uh, put forward this idea that this might be, some of them at least, might be killer acquisitions. And it might be some form of killer zone. What does it mean? It means that uh, the digital uh, platforms, when they see uh, some company that that might be a potential competitor, instead of basically uh, waiting to, uh, for that competitor to develop, they basically buy that competitor. Uh, now, and possibly, you know, there have been some mergers that have been uh, justified by this specific strategy. But at the same time, I would say we have to be very careful there, because for many of the startups, it seems that uh, being bought uh, by a major platform is also a way to uh, monetize the effort and the innovation uh, that has been put forward. Uh, and I think, you know, there we really need to be extremely careful to understand when we have issues of potential competition and that when actually we, we don't have issues of potential competition. And there I think they, uh, the competition laws and economics uh, are not developed that much with regards to uh, what we conceive as potential competition and the metrics for that. Uh, and, and finally, I think it's, it's quite important to have in mind also that the funding obviously is there, uh, but uh, funding is not always uh, what is uh, really missing. I mean, generally companies, when they are asking for, for funding, they also ask for quality certification. So there are some specific firms that are specialized in funding digital technologies that provide also quality certification, uh, in particular in the Silicon Valley. That's why, you know, you have a lot of Chinese firms going to Silicon Valley, they don't really, you know, they are huge capital markets in China as well, but still, you know, they prefer to go to Silicon Valley. Why is that? Because of the quality certification element. And therefore, there you might have some form of barrier to entry that might develop, and this is something we look uh, more uh, in more detail in our, in our report uh, with regards to financialization issue. Thank you very much again for this invitation. I'm afraid I need to go. Yeah, thank you, Yanis, and uh, good luck on your way to the airport. Um, but now it should be okay. So, um, Turning to my right hand side, so the question where the lady asked, so innovation not taking place because of big players, what to make out of that? Then we had the question of the uh, gentleman, the burden of regulation, GDPR, and especially the burden of, for small companies, so wouldn't that be a problem? And then the question uh, from the gentleman over here on big telcos and reg like regulatory sandboxes, um, especially, but maybe not exclusively for less developed countries. Martin. Thank you. I would like to pick two, two of the questions. The first question was uh, about exclusive data power. Uh, the view of our commission is that it is too early to have a general rule for opening data access because you need a period of time where the innovator, the company which innovates, has exclusive data power. But of course, exclusive data power has to be limited. And uh, I have um, described some of the limitations. One limitation is uh, that uh, the access to user data uh, should be steered by the user at the first hand. The second limitation is that dominant platforms should open um, more data. A third limitation is, of course, abuse of dominant uh, positions in other market could also be um, the reason for, um, uh, for orders to grant data access. And uh, the last thing is that all data that was produced by public money should be opened not only um, data within the public service, but also data that was generated, let me, let me say, in the sector of healthcare or mobility where we have public licenses. Second uh, question I would like to pick is uh, the question about regulatory sandboxes. We have seen um, in our work that there are a lot of um, very similar uh, competition problems in very different sectors of the economy. And therefore we propose some changes in sectoral regulation that introduced more instruments that foster competition. 
And this kind of sectoral regulation, from my perspective, could be a good place for having regulatory sandbox uh, concepts in place. Um, for example, uh, regarding the question of interoperability or regarding the question of data access, which somehow could be a, a test um, in one sector that could be, if a successful, transfer to other sectors, such as uh, the transfer of the regulation for the financial sector, PSD2, that, uh, that I would like to transfer to other sectors too. I completely agree. Uh, I'll try to answer some of the questions very, very briefly through an example. It relates in a way to the counterfactual question we had at the beginning. So when we did our banking study, our retail banking study in the UK, we were given a lot of political pressure to break up the main financial platforms. We decided, as I mentioned, to open them up through open APIs and data portability, and indeed needed a regulatory sandbox to be able to implement that. All right? And then we were asked by government, well, wouldn't you have had a faster result if you'd broken up these banks? Right? What is your test for success? You know, you've released some of this data, you've seen some new competition in the market, but we don't see consumers switching. And we want to see consumers switching amongst these platforms. And we said to them, our remedy and our, our test for success is not switching because British people switch their spouses more frequently than they switch their banks. Our remedy is not divorce, it's engagement. Our remedy is not leave Facebook, delete Facebook, delete Instagram, delete Twitter. It's not none of that. There are benefits. It's instead to engage better and to make these big platforms even more innovative. Now, the platforms will say, frankly, there's a lot of innovation, just relax, you know, and what you're proposing will chill, chill innovation. No, it won't. What we're trying to get them to do is to be, believe it or not, a little bit less lazy. And some will say, they're not lazy? Are you kidding? Google and Facebook and Twitter, they're amazing. No, but there are tons of studies that show that when you get into monopolistic or oligopolistic markets, investment patterns change, people get a little bit lazy. Microsoft basically ignored Internet Explorer when it was the dominant provider of the, of the uh, operating system. And so it, it needed Mozilla and others to come up ab about to be able to compete with it, and that required regulatory intervention. So my final point about this is there's tons of research to show that we need to have a better, and we could have a better e ecosystem if we allowed more interoperability and data portability and indeed faster competition law interventions. Right? And the research I'll cite is the Swedish research, which is very famous, which is the winner takes it all from ABBA. There's American research from Silicon Valley. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. All right, the eagles. And finally, the Scottish train spotting, choose life. That's what we want, more choice, more consumer choice, more choice amongst uh, platforms, more choice for, for, for um, uh, different merchants. And so let's have a lust for life, as Iggy Pop says. Thank you. Aye, aye, aye. This, is, this is impressive, uh, not only the content, but also the way you present it. Um, and I th think it will remain with us uh, um, uh, even after this, uh, this uh, session. Uh, so obviously, um, I think uh, the, the, we have seen uh, that this debate has, has, has shown us uh, once again, if you hadn't known before, uh, that uh, the, the debate is, is, is fascinating and uh, um, that the question of uh, data governance and competition uh, will remain with us. There was agreement that we need some kind of toolbox. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's quite uh, clear. There was a lot of, of emphasis on, on uh, expanding choice yeah. and, and, and on interoperability, being pro-competitive. There was uh, a lot of agreement, I think, of course, uh, making a competition law great again, um, but not limiting ourselves to comp competition law. We need to go beyond competition law if necessary as well. We, need to, uh, we probably need to, to um, uh, some some innovation and, and, and introduction of this of an ex anti mechanism or ex anti mechanisms. Actually, we try to do that in Germany. We we actually drawing on your proposition and to try to introduce something similar, let's say, in our competition um, uh, law, which is going to be difficult because they actually the big tech concerns they. They're a little bit reluctant to like that. So we're going to see uh, if, what, what's going to come out of it. So 
thank you very much indeed to, 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 to the panel, to the remaining uh, panel, but of course, uh, uh, all, even though he has left, to, to Yanis. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Martin and Philip, for having taken the time uh, to discuss this uh, fascinating topic with us. Thank you, um, uh, dear audience, very much for uh, having uh, taken the time, for having uh, uh, asked questions, and of course, also, also uh, the online community. I don't see you, but uh, uh, thank you very much for having uh, listened. So I wish you um, a good continuation of this Internet Governance uh, Forum, and uh, I hope to see you soon again in some discussions on some panel. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm very happy to, uh, to exchange uh, opinions and views with us. So thank you very much, and have a good day. Goodbye.